This is Audible. Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson For Beth Sanderson, who's been reading fantasy for longer than I've been alive, and fully deserves to have a grandson as loony as she is. Mistborn Sometimes I worry that I'm not the hero everyone thinks I am. The philosophers assure me that this is the time, that the signs have been met. But I still wonder if they have the wrong man. So many people depend on me. They say I will hold the future of the entire world on my arms. What would they think if they knew that their champion, the hero of ages, their savior, doubted himself? Perhaps they wouldn't be shocked at all. In a way, this is what worries me most. Maybe in their hearts they wonder, just as I do. When they see me, do they see a liar? Prologue 1. Ash fell from the sky. Lord Tresting frowned, glancing up at the ruddy midday sky as his servants scuttled forward, opening a parasol over Tresting and his distinguished guest. Ashfalls weren't that uncommon in the final empire, but Tresting had hoped to avoid getting soot stains on his fine new suit coat and red vest, which had just arrived via canal boat from Luthadel itself. Fortunately, there wasn't much wind. The parasol would likely be effective. Tresting stood with his guest on a small hilltop patio that overlooked the fields. Hundreds of people in brown smocks worked in the falling ash, caring for the crops. There was a sluggishness to their efforts, but of course that was the way of the ska. The peasants were an indolent, unproductive lot. They didn't complain, of course. They knew better than that. Instead, they simply worked with bowed heads, moving about their work with quiet apathy. The passing whip of a taskmaster would force them into dedicated motion for a few moments, but as soon as the taskmaster passed, they would return to their languor. Trusting turned to the man standing beside him on the hill. One would think, Trusting noted, that a thousand years of working in fields would have bred them to be a little more effective at it. The obligator turned, raising an eyebrow, the motion done as if to highlight his most distinctive feature— the intricate tattoos that laced the skin around his eyes. The tattoos were enormous, reaching all the way across his brow and up the sides of his nose. This was a full prelin, a very important obligator indeed. Tresting had his own personal obligators back at the manor, but they were only minor functionaries with barely a few marks around their eyes. This man had arrived from Luthadel with the same canal boat that had brought Tresting's new suit. You should see city ska, Tresting, the obligator said, turning back to watch the ska workers. These are actually quite diligent compared to those inside Luthadel. You have more direct control over your ska here. How many would you say you lose a month? Oh, half a dozen or so, Tresting said. Some to beatings, some to exhaustion. Runaways? Never. Tresting said. When I first inherited this land from my father, I had a few runaways, but I executed their families. The rest quickly lost heart. I've never understood men who have trouble with their ska. I find the creatures easy to control, if you show a properly firm hand. The obligator nodded, standing quietly in his grey robes. He seemed pleased, which was a good thing. The Ska weren't actually Tresting's property. Like all Ska, they belonged to the Lord Ruler. Tresting only leased the workers from his god, much in the same way he paid for the services of his obligators. The obligator looked down, checking his pocket watch, then glanced up at the sun. Despite the ashfall, the sun was bright this day, shining a brilliant crimson red behind the smoky blackness of the upper sky. Tresting removed a handkerchief and wiped his brow, thankful for the parasol's shade against the midday heat. "'Very well, Tresting,' the obligator said. "'I will carry your proposal to Lord Venture as requested. 
He will have a favorable report from me on your operations here. Trusting held in a sigh of relief. An obligator was required to witness any contract or business deal between noblemen. True, even a lowly obligator like the ones Trusting employed could serve as such a witness, but it meant so much more to impress Straff Venture's own obligator. The obligator turned toward him. I will leave back down the canal this afternoon. So soon? Trusting asked. Wouldn't you care to stay for supper? No, the obligator replied. Though there is another matter I wish to discuss with you. I came not only at the behest of Lord Venture, but to look in on some matters for the Canton of Inquisition. Rumors say that you like to dally with your scar women. Trusting felt a chill. The obligator smiled. He likely meant it to be disarming, but Trusting only found it eerie. Don't worry yourself, Trusting, the obligator said. If there had been any real worries about your actions, a steel inquisitor would have been sent here in my place. Trusting nodded slowly. Inquisitor. He'd never seen one of the inhuman creatures, but he had heard stories. I have been satisfied regarding your actions with the Scar women, the obligator said, looking back over the fields. What I've seen and heard here indicate that you always clean up your messes. A man such as yourself, efficient, productive, could go far in Luthadel. A few more years of work, some inspired mercantile deals, and who knows? The obligator turned away, and Trusting found himself smiling. It wasn't a promise or even an endorsement. For the most part, obligators were more bureaucrats and witnesses than they were priests. But to hear such praise from one of the Lord Ruler's own servants... Trusting knew that some nobility considered the obligators to be unsettling. Some men even considered them a bother. But at that moment, Trusting could have kissed his distinguished guest. Trusting turned back toward the Ska, who worked quietly beneath the bloody sun and the lazy flakes of ash. Trusting had always been a country nobleman, living on his plantation, dreaming of perhaps moving into Luthadel itself. He had heard of the balls and the parties, the glamour and the intrigue, and it excited him to no end. I'll have to celebrate tonight, he thought. There was that young girl in the fourteenth hovel that he'd been watching for some time. He smiled again. A few more years of work, the obligator had said. But could Trusting perhaps speed that up if he worked a little harder? His scar population had been growing lately. Perhaps if he pushed them a bit more, he could bring in an extra harvest this summer and fulfill his contract with Lord Venture in extra measure. Trusting nodded as he watched the crowd of lazy ska, some working with their hoes, others on hands and knees pushing the ash away from the fledgling crops. They didn't complain. They didn't hope. They barely dared think. That was the way it should be, for they were ska. They were... Trusting froze as one of the ska looked up. The man met Trusting's eyes, a spark... No, a fire of defiance showing in his expression. Trusting had never seen anything like it, not in the face of a scar. Trusting stepped backward reflexively, a chill running through him as the strange, straight-backed scar held his eyes. And smiled. Trusting looked away. Curtain! he snapped. The burly taskmaster rushed up the incline. Yes, my lord. Trusting turned, pointing at... He frowned. Where had that scar been standing? Working with their heads bowed, bodies stained by soot and sweat, they were so hard to tell apart. Trusting paused, searching. He thought he knew the place. An empty spot where nobody now stood. But no, that couldn't be it. The man couldn't have disappeared from the group so quickly. Where would he have gone? 
He must be in there somewhere, working with his head now properly bowed. Still, his moment of apparent defiance was inexcusable. My lord? Curtin asked again. The obligator stood at the side, watching curiously. It would not be wise to let the man know that one of the ska had acted so brazenly. Work the ska in that southern section a little harder, Tresting ordered, pointing. I see them being sluggish, even for ska. Beat a few of them. Curtin shrugged, but nodded. It wasn't much of a reason for a beating, but then he didn't need much of a reason to give the workers a beating. They were, after all, only Ska. Kelsier had heard stories. He had heard whispers of times when once long ago the sun had not been red. Times when the sky hadn't been clogged by smoke and ash when plants hadn't struggled to grow and when Ska hadn't been slaves. Times before the Lord Ruler. Those days, however, were nearly forgotten. Even the legends were growing vague. Kelsier watched the sun, his eyes following the giant red disk as it crept toward the western horizon. He stood quietly for a long moment, alone in the empty fields. The day's work was done. The sky had been herded back to their hovels. Soon the mists would come. Eventually, Kelsier sighed, then turned to pick his way across the furrows and pathways, weaving between large heaps of ash. He avoided stepping on the plants, though he wasn't sure why he bothered. The crops hardly seemed worth the effort. Wan, with wilted brown leaves, the plants seemed as depressed as the people who tended them. The ska hovels loomed in the waning light. Already Kelsier could see the mists beginning to form, clouding the air and giving the mound-like buildings a surreal, intangible look. The hovels stood unguarded. There was no need for watchers, for no ska would venture outside once night arrived. Their fear of the mists was far too strong. I'll have to cure them of that some day, Kelsier thought as he approached one of the larger buildings. But all things in their own time. He pulled open the door and slipped inside. Conversation stopped immediately. Kelsier closed the door, then turned with a smile to confront the room of about thirty ska. A fire pit burned weakly at the center, and the large cauldron beside it was filled with a vegetable dappled water the beginnings of an evening meal. The soup would be bland, of course. Still, the smell was enticing. "'Good evening, everyone,' Kelsier said with a smile, resting his pack beside his feet and leaning against the door. "'How was your day?' His words broke the silence, and the women returned to their dinner preparations. A group of men, sitting at a crude table, however— continued to regard Kelsier with dissatisfied expressions. "'Our day was filled with work, traveler,' said Tepper, one of the Ska elders. "'Something you managed to avoid.' "'Field work hasn't ever really suited me,' Kelsier said. "'It's far too hard on my delicate skin.' He smiled, holding up hands and arms that were lined with layers and layers of thin scars." They covered his skin, running lengthwise, as if some beast had repeatedly raked its claws up and down his arms. Tepper snorted. He was young to be an elder, probably barely into his forties. At most, he might be five years Kelsier's senior. However, the scrawny man held himself with the air of one who liked to be in charge. This is no time for levity, Tepper said sternly. When we harbor a traveler, we expect him to behave himself and avoid suspicion. When you ducked away from the fields this morning, you could have earned a whipping for the men around you. True, Kelsier said. But those men could also have been whipped for standing in the wrong place, for pausing too long, or for coughing when a taskmaster walked by. I once saw a man beaten because his master claimed that he had blinked inappropriately. Tepper sat with narrow eyes and a stiff posture, his arm resting on the table. 
His expression was unyielding. Kelsier sighed, rolling his eyes. Fine, if you want me to go, I'll be off then. He slung his pack up on his shoulder and nonchalantly pulled open the door. Thick mist immediately began to pour through the portal, drifting lazily across Kelsier's body, pooling on the floor and creeping across the dirt like a hesitant animal. Several people gasped in horror, though most of them were too stunned to make a sound. Kelsier stood for a moment, staring out into the dark mists, their shifting currents lit feebly by the cooking pit's coals. Close the door! Tepper's words were a plea, not a command. Kelsier did as requested, pushing the door closed and stemming the flood of white mist. The mist is not what you think. You fear it far too much. Men who venture into the mist lose their souls, a woman whispered. Her words raised a question. Had Kelsier walked in the mists? What then happened to his soul? If you only knew, Kelsier thought. Well, I guess this means I'm staying. He waved for a boy to bring him a stool. It's a good thing, too. It would have been a shame for me to leave before I shared my news. More than one person perked up at the comment. This was the real reason they tolerated him. The reason even the timid peasants would harbor a man such as Kelsier, a ska who defied the Lord Ruler's will by traveling from plantation to plantation. A renegade he might be, a danger to the entire community, but he brought news from the outside world. I come from the north, Kelsier said, from lands where the Lord Ruler's touch is less noticeable. He spoke in a clear voice, and people leaned unconsciously toward him as they worked. On the next day, Kelsier's words would be repeated to the several hundred people who lived in other hovels. The ska might be subservient, but they were incurable gossips. Local lords rule in the west, Kelsier said, and they are far from the iron grip of the Lord Ruler and his obligators. Some of these distant noblemen are finding that happy ska make better workers than mistreated ska. One man, Lord Renu, has even ordered his taskmasters to stop unauthorized beatings. There are whispers that he's considering paying wages to his plantation ska, like city craftsmen might earn. Nonsense, Tepper said. My apologies, Kelsier said. I didn't realize that Goodman Tepper had been to Lord Renew's estates recently. When you dined with him last, did he tell you something that he did not tell me? Tepper blushed. Ska did not travel, and they certainly didn't dine with lords. You think me a fool, traveler, Tepper said, but I know what you're doing. You're the one they call the survivor. Those scars on your arms give you away. You're a troublemaker. You travel the plantations, stirring up discontent. You eat our food, telling your grand stories and your lies, then you disappear and leave people like me to deal with the false hopes you give our children. Kelsier raised an eyebrow. Now, now, Goodman Tepper, he said. Your worries are completely unfounded. Why, I have no intention of eating your food. I brought my own. With that, Kelsier reached over and tossed his pack onto the earth before Tepper's table. The loose bag slumped to the side, dumping an array of foods to the ground. Fine breads, fruits, and even a few thick-cured sausages bounced free. A summer fruit rolled across the packed earthen floor and bumped lightly against Tepper's foot. The middle-aged skull regarded the fruit with stunned eyes. That's nobleman's food! Kelsier snorted. Barely. You know, for a man of renowned prestige and rank, your Lord Tresting has remarkably poor taste. His pantry is an embarrassment to his noble station. Tepper paled even further. That's where you went this afternoon, he whispered. You went to the manor. You stole from the master. Indeed, Kelsier said. And might I add that while your lord's taste in food is deplorable, his eye for soldiers is far more impressive. Sneaking into his manor during the day was quite a challenge. 
Tepper was still staring at the bag of food. If the taskmasters find this here... Well, I suggest you make it disappear, then, Kelsier said. I'd be willing to bet that it tastes a fair bit better than watered-down farlet soup. Two dozen sets of hungry eyes studied the food. If Tepper intended further arguments, he didn't make them quickly enough, for his silent pause was taken as agreement. Within a few minutes, the bag's contents had been inspected and distributed, and the pot of soup sat bubbling and ignored as the ska feasted on a meal far more exotic. Kelsier sat back, leaning against the hovel's wooden wall, and watching the people devour their food. He had spoken correctly. The pantry's offerings had been depressingly mundane. However, this was a people who had been fed on nothing but soup and gruel since they were children. To them, breads and fruits were rare delicacies, usually eaten only as aging discards brought down by the house servants. "'Your storytelling was cut short, young man,' an elderly Ska noted, hobbling over to sit on a stool beside Kelsier. "'Oh, I suspect there will be time for more later,' Kelsier said. "'Once all evidence of my thievery has been properly devoured. "'Don't you want any of it?' "'No, indeed,' the old man said. "'The last time I tried Lord's food I had stomach pains for three days. "'New tastes are like new ideas, young man. "'The older you get, the more difficult they are for you to stomach.' "'Kelsier paused. "'The old man was hardly an imposing sight.' His leathered skin and bald scalp made him look more frail than they did wise. Yet he had to be stronger than he looked. Few plantation ska lived to such ages. Many lords didn't allow the elderly to remain home from daily work, and the frequent beatings that made up a ska's life took a terrible toll on the elderly. "'What was your name again?' Kelsier asked. "'Menace.' Kelsier glanced back at Tepper. So, Goodman Menace, tell me something. Why do you let him lead? Menace shrugged. When you get to be my age, you have to be very careful where you waste your energy. Some battles just aren't worth fighting. There was an implication in Menace's eyes. He was referring to things greater than his own struggle with Tepper. You're satisfied with this, then? Kelsier asked, nodding toward the hovel and its half-starved, overworked occupants. You're content with a life full of beatings and endless drudgery? At least it's a life, Menace said. I know what wages malcontent and rebellion bring. The eye of the Lord Ruler and the ire of the Steel Ministry can be far more terrible than a few whippings. Men like you preach change, but I wonder— is this a battle we can really fight? You're fighting it already, Goodman Menace. You're just losing horribly. Kelsier shrugged. But what do I know? I'm just a traveling miscreant here to eat your food and impress your youths. Menace shook his head. You jest, but Tepper might have been right. I fear your visit will bring us grief. Kelsier smiled. That's why I didn't contradict him. At least, not on the troublemaker point. He paused, then smiled more deeply. In fact, I'd say calling me a troublemaker is probably the only accurate thing Tepper has said since I got here. How do you do that? Menace asked, frowning. What? Smile so much. Oh, I'm just a happy person. Menace glanced down at Kelsier's hands. You know, I've only seen scars like those on one other person. And he was dead. His body was returned to Lord Tresting as proof that his punishment had been carried out. Menace looked up at Kelsier. He'd been caught speaking of rebellion. Tresting sent him to the pits of Hathsin, where he was worked until he died. The lad lasted less than a month. Kelsier glanced down at his hands and forearms. They still burned sometimes, though he was certain the pain was only in his mind. He looked up at Menace and smiled. 
You ask why I smile, Goodman Menace? Well, the Lord Ruler thinks he has claimed laughter and joy for himself. I'm disinclined to let him do so. This is one battle that doesn't take very much effort to fight. Menace stared at Kelsier, and for a moment Kelsier thought the old man might smile in return. However, Menace eventually just shook his head. I don't know. I just don't... The scream cut him off. It came from outside, perhaps to the north, though the mists distorted sounds. The people in the hovel fell silent, listening to the faint, high-pitched yells. Despite the distance and the mist, Kelsier could hear the pain contained in those screams. Kelsier burned tin. It was simple for him now, after years of practice. The tin sat with other alimantic metals within his stomach, swallowed earlier, waiting for him to draw upon them. He reached inside with his mind and touched the tin, tapping powers he still barely understood. The tin flared to life within him, burning his stomach like the sensation of a hot drink swallowed too quickly. Alimantic power surged through his body, enhancing his senses. The room around him became crisp, the dull fire pit flaring to near blinding brightness. He could feel the grain in the wood of the stool beneath him. He could still taste the remnants of the loaf of bread he'd snacked on earlier. Most importantly, he could hear the screams with supernatural ears. Two separate people were yelling. One was an older woman, the other a younger woman, perhaps a child. The younger screams were getting farther and farther away. Poor Jess, a nearby woman said, her voice booming in Kelsier's enhanced ears. That child of hers was a curse. It's better for Ska not to have pretty daughters. Tepper nodded. Lord Tresting was sure to send for the girl sooner or later. We all knew it. Jess knew it. Still a shame, though, another man said. The screams continued in the distance. Burning tin, Kelsier was able to judge the direction accurately. Her voice was moving toward the Lord's manor. The sounds set something off within him, and he felt his face flush with anger. Kelsier turned. Does Lord Tresting ever return the girls after he's finished with them? Old Menace shook his head. Lord Tresting is a law-abiding nobleman. He has the girls killed after a few weeks. He doesn't want to catch the eye of the Inquisitors. That was the Lord Ruler's command. He couldn't afford to have half-breed children running around, children who might possess powers that Ska weren't even supposed to know existed. The screams waned, but Kelsier's anger only built. The yells reminded him of other screams, a woman's screams from the past. He stood abruptly, stool toppling to the ground behind him. Careful, lad, Menace said apprehensively. Remember what I said about wasting energy? You'll never raise that rebellion of yours if you get yourself killed tonight. Kelsier glanced toward the old man. Then, through the screams and the pain, he forced himself to smile. I'm not here to lead a rebellion among you, Goodman Menace. I just want to stir up a little trouble. What good could that do? Kelsier's smile deepened. New days are coming. Survive a little longer, and you just might see great happenings in the final empire. I bid you all thanks for your hospitality. With that, he pulled open the door and strode out into the mist. Menace lay awake in the early hours of morning. It seemed that the older he became, the more difficult it was for him to sleep. This was particularly true when he was troubled about something, such as the traveler's failure to return to the hovel. Menace hoped that Kelsier had come to his senses and decided to move on. However, that prospect seemed unlikely. Menace had seen the fire in Kelsier's eyes. It seemed such a shame that a man who had survived the pits would instead find death here, on a random plantation trying to protect a girl everyone else had given up for dead. How would Lord Tresting react? 
He was said to be particularly harsh with anyone who interrupted his nighttime enjoyments. If Kelsier had managed to disturb the master's pleasures, Tresting might easily decide to punish the rest of his ska by association. Eventually the other ska began to awake. Menace lay on the hard earth, bones aching, back complaining, muscles exhausted, trying to decide if it was worth rising. Each day he nearly gave up. Each day it was a little harder. One day he would just stay in the hovel, waiting until the taskmasters came to kill those who were too sick or too elderly to work. But not today. He could see too much fear in the eyes of the ska. They knew that Kelsier's nighttime activities would bring trouble. They needed menace. They looked to him. He needed to get up. And so he did. Once he started moving, the pains of age decreased slightly, and he was able to shuffle out of the hovel toward the fields, leaning on a younger man for support. It was then that he caught a scent in the air. What's that? he asked. Do you smell smoke? Shum, the lad upon whom Menace leaned, paused. The last remnants of the night's mist had burned away, and the red sun was rising behind the sky's usual haze of blackish clouds. I always smell smoke lately, Shum said. The ash mounts are violent this year. No, Menace said, feeling increasingly apprehensive. This is different. He turned to the north, toward where a group of ska were gathering. He let go of Shum, shuffling toward the group, feet kicking up dust and ash as he moved. At the center of the group of people, he found Jess. Her daughter, the one they all assumed had been taken by Lord Tresting, stood beside her. The young girl's eyes were red from lack of sleep, but she appeared unharmed. She came back not long after they took her, the woman was explaining. She came and pounded on the door, crying in the mist. Flynn was sure it was just a mist wraith impersonating her, but I had to let her in. I don't care what he says, I'm not giving her up. I brought her out in the sunlight and she didn't disappear. That proves she's not a mist wraith. Menace stumbled back from the growing crowd. Did none of them see it? No taskmasters came to break up the group. No soldiers came to make the morning population counts. Something was very wrong. Menace continued to the north, moving frantically toward the manor house. By the time he arrived, others had noticed the twisting line of smoke that was just barely visible in the morning light. Menace wasn't the first to arrive at the edge of the short hilltop plateau, but the group made way for him when he did. The manor house was gone. Only a blackened, smoldering scar remained. By the Lord Ruler, Menace whispered. What happened here? He killed them all. Menace turned. The speaker was Jess's girl. She stood looking down at the fallen house, a satisfied expression on her youthful face. They were dead when he brought me out, she said. All of them. The soldiers, the taskmasters, the lords. Dead. Even Lord Tresting and his obligators. The master had left me, going to investigate when the noises began. On the way out I saw him lying in his own blood, stab wounds in his chest. The man who saved me threw a torch in the building as we left. This man, Menace said, he had scars on his hands and arms reaching past the elbows. The girl nodded silently. What kind of demon was that man? One of the ska muttered uncomfortably. Mist Wraith, another whispered, apparently forgetting that Kelsier had gone out during the day. But he did go out into the mist, Menace thought. And how did he accomplish a feat like this? Lord Tresting kept over two dozen soldiers. Did Kelsier have a hidden band of rebels, perhaps? Kelsier's words from the night before sounded in his ears. New days are coming. But what of us? Tepper asked, terrified. What will happen when the Lord Ruler hears this? He'll think that we did it. He'll send us to the pits, or maybe just send his coloss to slaughter us outright. Why would that troublemaker do something like this? Doesn't he understand the damage he's done? 
He understands, Menace said. He warned us, Tepper. He came to stir up trouble. But why? Because he knew we'd never rebel on our own, so he gave us no choice. Tepper paled. Lord Ruler, Menace thought. I can't do this. I can barely get up in the mornings. I can't save this people. But what other choice was there? Menace turned. Gather the people, Tepper. We must flee before word of this disaster reaches the Lord Ruler. Where will we go? The caves to the east, Menace said. Travelers say there are rebel ska hiding in them. Perhaps they'll take us in. Tepper paled further. But we'd have to travel for days, spend nights in the mist. We can do that, Menace said, or we can stay here and die. Tepper stood frozen for a moment, and Menace thought the shock of it all might have overwhelmed him. Eventually, however, the younger man scurried off to gather the others as commanded. Menace sighed, looking up toward the trailing line of smoke, cursing the man Kelsier quietly in his mind. New days indeed. Part One The Survivor of Hath Sin I consider myself to be a man of principle, but what man does not? Even the cutthroat, I have noticed, considers his actions moral after a fashion. Perhaps another person, reading of my life, would name me a religious tyrant. He could call me arrogant. What is to make that man's opinion any less valid than my own? I guess it all comes down to one fact. In the end, I'm the one with the armies. One Ash fell from the sky. Vin watched the downy flakes drift through the air. Leisurely, careless, free. The puffs of soot fell like black snowflakes, descending upon the dark city of Luthadel. They drifted in corners, blowing in the breeze and curling in tiny whirlwinds over the cobblestones. They seemed so uncaring. What would that be like? Finn sat quietly in one of the crew's watch holes, a hidden alcove built into the bricks on the side of the safe house. From within it, a crew member could watch the street for signs of danger. Vin wasn't on duty. The watch hole was simply one of the few places where she could find solitude. And Vin liked solitude. When you're alone, no one can betray you. Reen's words. Her brother had taught her so many things— then had reinforced them by doing what he'd always promised he would, by betraying her himself. It's the only way you'll learn. Anyone will betray you, Vin. Anyone. The ash continued to fall. Sometimes Vin imagined she was like the ash, or the wind, or the mist itself. A thing without thought, capable of simply being, not thinking, caring, or hurting. Then she could be free. She heard shuffling a short distance away. Then the trap door at the back of the small chamber snapped open. Vin, Ulyff said, sticking his head into the room. There you are. Cayman's been searching for you for a half hour. That's kind of why I hid in the first place. You should get going, Ulyff said. The job's almost ready to begin. Ulyff was a gangly boy, nice after his own fashion, naive if one who had grown up in the underworld could ever really be called naive. Of course, that didn't mean he wouldn't betray her. Betrayal had nothing to do with friendship. It was a simple fact of survival. Life was harsh on the streets, and if a ska thief wanted to keep from being caught and executed, he had to be practical. And ruthlessness was the very most practical of emotions. Another of Reen's sayings. Well, Ulyff asked, you should go. Cayman's mad. When is he not? 
However, Vin nodded, scrambling out of the cramped yet comforting confines of the watch hole. She brushed past Ulef and hopped out of the trap door, moving into a hallway, then a rundown pantry. The room was one of many at the back of the store that served as a front for the safe house. The crew's lair itself was hidden in a tunneled stone cavern beneath the building. She left the building through a back door, you left trailing behind her. The job would happen a few blocks away in a richer section of town. It was an intricate job, one of the most complex Vin had ever seen. Assuming Cayman wasn't caught, the payoff would be great indeed. If he was caught, well... Scamming noblemen and obligators was a very dangerous profession, but it certainly beat working in the forges or the textile mills. Vin exited the alleyway, moving out into a dark, tenement-lined street in one of the city's many ska slums. Ska too sick to work lay huddled in corners and gutters, ash drifting around them. Vin kept her head down and pulled up her cloak's hood against the still-falling flakes. Free... No, I'll never be free. Reen made certain of that when he left. There you are. Cayman lifted a squat, fat finger and jabbed it toward her face. Where were you? Vin didn't let hatred or rebellion show in her eyes. She simply looked down, giving Cayman what he expected to see. There were other ways to be strong. That lesson she had learned on her own. Cayman growled slightly, then raised his hand and backhanded her across the face. The force of the blow threw Vin back against the wall, and her cheek blazed with pain. She slumped against the wood, but bore the punishment silently. Just another bruise. She was strong enough to deal with it. She'd done so before. Listen, Cayman hissed, this is an important job. It's worth thousands of boxings, worth more than you a hundred times over. I won't have you fouling it up. Understand? Vin nodded. Cayman studied her for a moment, his pudgy face red with anger. Finally, he looked away, muttering to himself. He was annoyed about something, something more than just Vin. Perhaps he had heard about the Ska Rebellion several days to the north. One of the provincial lords, Themis Tresting, had apparently been murdered, his manor burned to the ground. Such disturbances were bad for business. They made the aristocracy more alert and less gullible. That, in turn, could cut seriously into Cayman's profits. He's looking for someone to punish, Vin thought. He always gets nervous before a job. She looked up at Cayman, tasting blood on her lip. She must have let some of her confidence show because he glanced at her out of the corner of his eye, and his expression darkened. He raised his hand as if to strike her again. Vin used up a bit of her luck. She'd expended just a smidgen. She'd need the rest for the job. She directed the luck at Cayman, calming his nervousness. The crew leader paused, oblivious of Vin's touch, yet feeling its effects nonetheless. He stood for a moment— then he sighed, turning away and lowering his hand. Vin wiped her lip as Cayman waddled away. The thiefmaster looked very convincing in his nobleman's suit. It was as rich a costume as Vin had ever seen. It had a white shirt overlaid by a deep green vest with engraved gold buttons. The black suit coat was long, after the current fashion, and he wore a matching black hat. His fingers sparkled with rings, and he even carried a fine jeweling cane. Indeed, Cayman did an excellent job of imitating a nobleman. When it came to playing a role, there were few thieves more competent than Cayman, assuming he could keep his temper under control. The room itself was less impressive. Vin pulled herself to her feet as Cayman began to snap at some of the other crew members. They had rented one of the suites at the top of a local hotel— not too lavish, but that was the idea. Cayman was going to be playing the part of Lord Jadu, a country nobleman who had hit upon hard financial times and come to Luthadel to get some final desperate contracts. The main room had been transformed into a sort of audience chamber, 
set with a large desk for Cayman to sit behind, the walls decorated with cheap pieces of art. Two men stood beside the desk, dressed in formal steward's clothing. They would play the part of Cayman's manservants. "'What is this ruckus?' a man asked, entering the room. He was tall, dressed in a simple gray shirt and a pair of slacks, with a thin sword tied at his waist. Theron was the other crew leader. This particular scam was actually his. He'd brought in Cayman as a partner. He'd needed someone to play Lord Jadu, and everyone knew that Cayman was one of the best. Cayman looked up. Hmm, a ruckus? Oh, that was just a minor discipline problem. Don't bother yourself, Theron. Cayman punctuated his remark with a dismissive wave of the hand. There was a reason he played such a good aristocrat. He was arrogant enough that he could have been from one of the great houses. Theron's eyes narrowed. Vin knew what the man was probably thinking. He was deciding how risky it would be to put a knife in Cayman's fat back once the scam was over. Eventually, the taller crew leader looked away from Cayman, glancing at Vin. "'Who's this?' he asked. "'Just a member of my crew,' Cayman said. "'I thought we didn't need anyone else.' "'Well, we need her,' Cayman said. "'Ignore her. My end of the operation is none of your concern.' Theron eyed Vin, obviously noting her bloodied lip. She glanced away. Theron's eyes lingered on her, however, running down the length of her body. She wore a simple white-buttoned shirt and a pair of overalls. Indeed, she was hardly enticing. Scrawny, with a youthful face, she supposedly didn't even look her sixteen years. Some men preferred such women, however. She considered using a bit of luck on him, but eventually he turned away. "'The obligator is nearly here,' Theron said. "'Are you ready?' Cayman rolled his eyes, settling his bulk down into the chair behind the desk. "'Everything is perfect. Leave me be, Theron. Go back to your room and wait.' Theron frowned, then spun and walked from the room, muttering to himself. Vin scanned the room, studying the decor, the servants, the atmosphere. Finally she made her way to Cayman's desk. The crew leader sat rifling through a stack of papers— apparently trying to decide which ones to put out on the desktop. Cayman, Vin said quietly. The servants are too fine. Cayman frowned, looking up. What is that you're babbling? The servants, Vin repeated, still speaking in a soft whisper. Lord Jadu is supposed to be desperate. He'd have rich clothing left over from before, but he wouldn't be able to afford such rich servants. He'd use ska. Cayman glared at her, but he paused. Physically, there was little difference between noblemen and Ska. The servants Cayman had appointed, however, were dressed as minor noblemen, they were allowed to wear colorful vests, and they stood a little confidently. "'The obligator has to think that you're nearly impoverished,' Vin said. "'Pack the room with a lot of Ska servants instead.' "'What do you know?' Cayman said, scowling at her. "'Enough?' She immediately regretted the word. It sounded too rebellious. Cayman raised a bejeweled hand, and Vin braced herself for another slap. She couldn't afford to use up any more luck. She had precious little remaining anyway. However, Cayman didn't hit her. Instead, he sighed and rested a pudgy hand on her shoulder. "'Why do you insist on provoking me, Vin? You know the debts your brother left when he ran away?' Do you realize that a less merciful man than myself would have sold you to the whoremasters long ago? How would you like that, serving in some nobleman's bed until he grew tired of you and had you executed? Vin looked down at her feet. Cayman's grip grew tight, his fingers pinching her skin where neck met shoulder, and she gasped in pain despite herself. He grinned at the reaction. "'Honestly, I don't know why I keep you, Vin,' he said, increasing the pressure of his grip. "'I should have gotten rid of you months ago, when your brother betrayed me. "'I suppose I just have too kindly a heart.' He finally released her, then pointed for her to stand over by the side of the room, next to a tall indoor plant. 
She did as ordered, orienting herself so she had a good view of the entire room. As soon as Cayman looked away, she rubbed her shoulder. Just another pain. I can deal with pain. Cayman sat for a few moments. Then, as expected, he waved to the two servants at his side. You two, he said. You're dressed too richly. Go put on something that makes you look like ska servants instead. And bring back six more men with you when you come. Soon the room was filled, as Vin had suggested. The obligator arrived a short time later. Vin watched Prelin Laird step haughtily into the room. Shaved bald, like all obligators, he wore a set of dark gray robes. The ministry tattoos around his eyes identified him as a prelin, a senior bureaucrat in the ministry's canton of finance. A set of lesser obligators trailed behind him, their eye tattoos far less intricate. Cayman rose as the prelin entered, a sign of respect something even the highest of the great house noblemen would show to an obligator of Laird's rank. Laird gave no bow or acknowledgment of his own, instead striding forward and taking the seat in front of Cayman's desk. One of the crewmen, impersonating a servant, rushed forward, bringing chilled wine and fruit for the obligator. Laird picked at the fruit, letting the servant stand obediently, holding the platter of food as if he were a piece of furniture. Lord Jadou... Laird finally said, I am glad we finally have the opportunity to meet. As am I, your grace, came and said. Why is it again that you were unable to come to the Canton building, instead requiring that I visit you here? My knees, your grace, came and said. My physicians recommend that I travel as little as possible. And you were rightly apprehensive about being drawn into a ministry stronghold, Vin thought. I see, Laird said. Bad knees. An unfortunate attribute in a man who deals in transportation. I don't have to go on the trips, Your Grace, came and said, bowing his head. Just organize them. Good, Vin thought. Make sure you remain subservient, Cayman. You need to seem desperate. Vin needed this scam to succeed. Cayman threatened her, and he beat her, but he considered her a good luck charm. She wasn't sure if he knew why his plans went better when she was in the room, but he had apparently made the connection. That made her valuable, and Reen had always said that the surest way to stay alive in the underworld was to make yourself indispensable. "'I see,' Laird said again. Well, I fear that our meeting has come too late for your purposes. The Canton of Finance has already voted on your proposal. So soon? Cayman asked with genuine surprise. Yes, Laird replied, taking a sip of his wine, still not dismissing the servant. We have decided not to accept your contract. Cayman sat for a moment, stunned. I'm sorry to hear that, Your Grace. Laird came to meet you, Vin thought. That means he's still in a position to negotiate. Indeed, Cayman continued, seeing what Vin had. That is especially unfortunate, as I was ready to make the Ministry an even better offer. Laird raised a tattooed eyebrow. I doubt it will matter. There is an element of the council who feels that the canton would receive better service if we found a more stable house to transport our people. That would be a grave mistake, Cayman said smoothly. Let us be frank, Your Grace. We both know that this contract is House Jadu's last chance. Now that we've lost the Farwan deal, we cannot afford to run our canal boats to Luthadel any more. Without the Ministry's patronage, my house is financially doomed. This is doing very little to persuade me, your lordship, the obligator said. Isn't it? came and asked. Ask yourself this, your grace. Who will serve you better? Will it be the house that has dozens of contracts to divide its attention, 
or the house that views your contract as its last hope. The canton of finance will not find a more accommodating partner than a desperate one. Let my boats be the ones that bring your acolytes down from the north. Let my soldiers escort them, and you will not be disappointed. Good, Vin thought. I see, the obligator said, now troubled. I would be willing to give you an extended contract, locked in at the price of fifty boxings a head per trip, Your Grace. Your acolytes would be able to travel our boats at their leisure, and would always have the escorts they need. The obligator raised an eyebrow. That's half the former fee. I told you, Cayman said. We're desperate. My house needs to keep its boats running. Fifty boxings will not make us a profit, but that doesn't matter. Once we have the ministry contract to bring us stability, we can find other contracts to fill our coffers. Laird looked thoughtful. It was a fabulous deal, one that might ordinarily have been suspicious. However, Cayman's presentation created the image of a house on the brink of financial collapse. The other crew leader, Theron, had spent five years building, scamming, and finagling to create this moment. The ministry would be remiss not to consider the opportunity. Laird was realizing just that. The steel ministry was not just the force of bureaucracy and legal authority in the final empire. It was like a noble house unto itself. The more wealth it had, the better its own mercantile contracts, the more leverage the various ministry cantons had with each other, and with the noble houses. Laird was still obviously hesitant, however. Vin could see the look in his eyes, the suspicion she knew well. He was not going to take the contract. Now, Vin thought, it's my turn. Vin used her luck on Laird. She reached out tentatively, not even really sure what she was doing or why she could even do it. Yet her touch was instinctive, trained through years of subtle practice. She'd been ten years old before she'd realized that other people couldn't do what she could. She pressed against Laird's emotions, dampening them. He became less suspicious, less afraid. Docile. His worries melted away, and Vin could see a calm sense of control begin to assert itself in his eyes. Yet Laird still seemed slightly uncertain. Vin pushed harder. He cocked his head, looking thoughtful. He opened his mouth to speak, but she pushed against him again, desperately using up her last pinch of luck. He paused again. Very well, he finally said. I will take this new proposal to the council. Perhaps an agreement can still be reached. If men read these words, let them know that power is a heavy burden. Seek not to be bound by its chains. The terrace prophecies say that I will have the power to save the world. They hint, however, that I will have the power to destroy it as well. 2. In Kelsier's opinion, the city of Luthadel, seat of the Lord Ruler, was a gloomy sight. Most of the buildings had been built from stone blocks, with tile roofs for the wealthy and simple peaked wooden roofs for the rest. The structures were packed closely together, making them seem squat, despite the fact that they were generally three stories high. The tenements and shops were uniform in appearance. This was not a place to draw attention to itself. Unless, of course, you were a member of the high nobility. Interspersed throughout the city were a dozen or so monolithic keeps. Intricate, with rows of spear-like spires or deep archways, these were the homes of the high nobility. In fact, they were the mark of a high noble family. Any family who could afford to build a keep and maintain a high-profile presence in Luthadel was considered to be a great house. Most of the open ground in the city was around these keeps. 
The patches of space amid the tenements were like clearings in a forest. The keeps themselves like solitary mounts, rising above the rest of the landscape. Black mountains. Like the rest of the city, the keeps were stained by countless years of ash falls. Every structure in Luthadel, virtually every structure Kelsier had ever seen, had been blackened to some degree. Even the city wall, upon which Kelsier now stood,